your nose. Mm -hmm. So good morning, everyone. This is Gil Price coming to you live from North Seattle. I'm following the governor's orders by wearing my mask this morning. So uh, we'll cover a few little housekeeping uh, details regarding Zoom. Um, we are recording this. Okay, it looks like everyone's in right now. So good morning again. This is Gil Price. I'm the Executive Director at Condominium Law Group. So, um, boy, it's hard to talk with this mask on. So uh, if you go to the bottom of your Zoom screen, you're going to see a few um, icons there. We have everyone muted. If you want to unmute yourself, you're welcome to do so. Uh, if you have a question, we prefer you keep it on mute so that we don't hear any of the background noise in your home offices. Video, if you want us to see you, click the stop video. If you don't want us to see you, click it again. Uh, you can click on the participant icon. You can see who's there. If you click on the chat icon, uh, that window will open on the right of your screen and you can send everyone or me or Valerie a question. I'll be monitoring the Zoom group chat during our Zoom meeting today. We do have some questions that people submitted ahead of time, so thank you very much for that. Um, it's always good to get those questions, and I'm here to say we don't have a pool question, but I have a feeling we'll still talk about pools. So, um, okay, I'm going to turn this over to my uh, two attorney colleagues, Valerie and Ken, partners in our firm. We're going to kick it off with Valerie this morning, and she's going to give us an update on the proclamation. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. It's good to see you guys. Good morning, everybody. Um, <clears throat> well, as we expected, uh, but of course, a couple of days late, just like the, the previous time, the governor did extend the proclamations that affect community associations last week, and this time he went ahead and extended them through August 1st, through the end of the day, through midnight on August 1st. So the good news about that is that we won't have to keep guessing every week or two whether he's going to update the proclamation at least not again until august so that's good as a reminder <clears throat> what those proclamations do for associations or how they affect associations i guess i should say is that they prohibit community associations from charging and collecting late fees and interest for unpaid assessments they also prohibit associations from charging and collecting fines compliance fines and they also allow associations that wouldn't otherwise have the authority under their governing documents to conduct board meetings and association meetings remotely uh, using a medium somewhat like this or another one that um, affords people the opportunity to participate in real time. So the really good news, especially about how long the governor extended the proclamation for this time is we had, had a, we had a lot of questions in, in the past from associations that were worried about sending out notice of an annual meeting by Zoom and then having the proclamation expire before the, the meeting could actually take place. So we, we want to remind everybody that you could send out a 14-day notice of an annual meeting this week and, and still conduct the meeting before the proclamation is set to expire on August 1st. So we continue to think that the risk of conducting an annual meeting remotely by Zoom or some other method like this is very, very low, even if you were to do so after the proclamation expired. Um, <clears throat> I think when all of this started in March, everybody had an impression and certainly a hope that it was going to, the restrictions on our ability to kind of move around and do business as usual were going to be relatively short lived, that this was going to be a, a, a quicker situation than it's turned out to be. And I think the a uh, dramatic increase in the number of COVID cases as states reopened with varying degrees of speed um, has made it really clear that COVID is not going anywhere in the short term. And so we are likely facing restrictions such as, you know, similar, in, at least in some ways, to the ones that we're operating under right now for a longer period of time than we all hoped initially. So uh, I think that we all need to be preparing our clients and, and our boards need to be preparing themselves as well as the homeowners um, that they are working with or serving, that this is a situation that's more likely to stick around for, you know, something closer to like a year or two, as opposed to a couple of months, like we all initially hoped. Um, and so it's not going to be business as usual for quite a while again. So 
So the, the proclamations have been extended. Even if you're worried about conducting an annual meeting after a proclamation were to expire, you have enough time to send out a notice this week and get the meeting in before the current proclamation expires. We think it's, that it's gonna be extended again. It's a little bit harder to know for how long. I really liked that he did it for you know three and a half weeks this time or for almost four weeks um, so that we don't have to kind of revisit the same thing every two weeks and figure out what the heck he's gonna do this time around. Um, but also we think that the risk of conducting meetings remotely, even if it does expire on August 1st, is relatively low. And also if you have clients that have gotten, they, they kind of like the ability to, to do the Zoom you know, board meetings or the annual meeting remotely like this, um, consider talking with them too about making an amendment to their governing documents so that they have the ability to do things like this longer term. Because um, the proclamation will eventually expire. We don't know exactly when that's gonna happen. And it would probably be nice for a lot of our clients to kind of baby step their way into the 21st century in this way. So, um, so that's the recap on the proclamations. The next thing that we want to cover is uh, up, uh, the mandate statewide now, not just for individuals to wear masks when they're out in public, but for businesses to refuse service to anyone who is not <coughs> wearing a cover of something to cover their their uh, their nose and their mouth. So <clears throat> the mandate for people individuals to wear masks uh, was actually uh, implemented I think Friday before last. There is no enforcement mechanism um, for individuals to use. You can't call the cops if you see somebody not wearing a mask. The indication is that if you see somebody not wearing a mask and you think that they're violating the mandate, you're, there's really just nothing for you to do about it. Just ignore it and go about your business. Um, there are very few exceptions to the mandate to wear masks, um, but again, there's no enforcement mechanism. Uh, the newer restriction that the governor um, mandated last week, but that went into effect, I believe yesterday, is that businesses statewide are now required to refuse to serve anyone who is not wearing a mask. And um, we did have some questions that came in about that. One was um, uh, about whether management companies uh, fall under this requirement and if management companies are indeed required to refuse service to um, individuals who drop in and who are not wearing a mask. And we think that the answer is very clearly yes, management companies are businesses and you are required to refuse service to someone who tries to come in to your business and is not wearing a mask. Um, the comment that was offered in the question that we received was basically that it seemed kind of silly because by the time you're done having the argument about the person not wearing a mask, you could have just accepted their payment and sent them on their way already. Um, and yes, that's probably true. Uh, but we do have some practical suggestions that, you know, maybe would help deal with those types of scenarios. One is that, um, and this is something, this is what we're doing at Condominium Law Group. Our, even though our business is open, our door is not unlocked. We're not open to the public uh, or to walk-in business, I guess. Let's put it that way. So one way for you to control the ability of people without masks to come into your business is to just lock your front door. Um, don't allow walk-ins that aren't wearing masks. So I know it creates a practical challenge of requiring someone to, you know, go open the door every time somebody comes and maybe you don't have a bell, maybe there's not a clear line of sight from your receptionist to that front door. So there are challenges that, that are presented or that could be presented by that choice. Um, the flip side is that if you are the one who's opening the door to someone, uh, anytime you have someone walk in to drop off a payment or otherwise uh, drop in on your business, then they don't even get in your front door if they're not wearing a mask. So it kind of eliminates the concern about why, why am I gonna spend time arguing with this person about wearing a mask when I can just take their payment and send them on their way. Um, I also did a little bit of looking into um, the question of enforcement on this because I, I, I'm sure that there were plenty of people and none of, none of you on this call, but plenty of people who would be like, well, there, if there's no way to enforce it, then why am I gonna do that? You know. <clears throat> basically, what, how does it hurt me if I refuse to enforce that in my business? I don't want to deal with pissed off clients. I'm just, I'm just going to look the other way when somebody comes in not wearing a mask. Um, the state is going to be enforcing the mandate requiring businesses to refuse to serve people not wearing masks. So um, I'm not exactly sure what the enforcement will look like. I imagine that it will be fines, but there are two ways right now that people can report businesses who do not um, 
carry out this mandate. There's an anonymous online form. So somebody can, uh, can report your business anonymously for failing to um, enforce this mandate. And they also can call the State Department of Labor and Industries. And LNI is going to be the industry or the, sorry, the agency that leads the enforcement on the requirement to refuse service to those not wearing masks. So, so that's the recap on those things. Um, related to the mask mandate, um, we did have a question that came in about how, how does this work for HOAs? I mean, we're nonprofit corporations. Are we a business? Are we a not a business? You know, what do we hey, do? Valerie? Yeah. One, one thing I, that I think you didn't mention yeah. is if you have people show up at your business, you can give them a mask. Yes. <clears throat> so every uh, employer is required <clears throat> to be supplying masks to their employees. You know, we have basically a box of, you know, 50 of the masks that you can buy on Amazon for about $25 at our front door. And if someone, whether it's an employee or a delivery person, shows up and needs to come in, they can get a mask and be compliant because we've given them a mask. And it's a cheap way of getting compliance. That's a, thank you for reminding me about that, Ken. Yes. And, and I think that's something that we said last week when it came to HOAs who were concerned about, well, gosh, are, do we, how do we make our, you know, now that we're required, now that individuals are required statewide to wear masks, how do we make our owners do this? And I think part of the answer is that you really can't make anybody do anything, but one of the ways that you can encourage people to do it is by providing the masks, which are, you know, um, a relatively low cost uh, to provide them at two bucks a piece. Uh, sorry, is it $25 for 50 of them, Ken? Uh, when we bought said? them on Amazon, yes. So 50 cents bucks a piece. I was, doing, I was doing my math in, in the opposite. Um, so, so that does lead to the next part of the discussion, which is whether HOAs are considered, you know, businesses. And I think, you know, there's a little bit of a variety, obviously, in, our, in, our, in the types of community associations that we serve. But for the purpose of this discussion, if you are um, a community that has a lobby, for example, where you've got delivery people coming in and out, and you also have homeowners coming in and out or visitors coming in and out, um, I think that reminding your homeowners that masks are mandated, I think posting signs, asking people to wear masks is helpful, providing masks for those who might come into that space and who may not be wearing them, um, that's also helpful. Uh, again, I don't think that, uh, do I think that an association that allows a homeowner into the lobby and doesn't physically force them to wear a mask is subject to enforcement under the, you know, the business part of these mandates? I, you know, I think that is a very tenuous um, possibility that would go nowhere, basically. So I think what we, we would just encourage community associations to keep doing what we started talking about last week, which is educate and inform your homeowners remind them about the mandate to wear masks, ask them to have their visitors wear masks. Um, I think you can require, uh, uh, you know, vendors that are coming into your community to, to work in your association buildings to wear masks. Um, but more importantly, their employers should be requiring them to do that. Um, <clears throat> but I don't think HOAs have any mechanism to force people to wear masks. And we are advising our clients against, you know, finding, well, first of all, you can't find anybody right now anyways under the proclamation, but we're, we're, we're telling our clients they should not be treating the, ma the mask mandate as an enforcement issue within their communities. So, <clears throat> um, go ahead. Bill, Bill, has a question. It looks yep. Yeah, we have a few additional mask comments coming in through the chat feature this morning, Valerie and Ken. So, uh, let me jump on the first one here. <clears throat> so as council, do you define common areas as public spaces? And if so, how should a board enforce maskings, if at all? I think, I don't, I, I think the answer to that question, I think the answer to the second part of that question is really sort of makes the first part irrelevant, whether it's considered a public space or not a public space. The comments that I just offered about enforcing the mask requirement is how we are advising our clients to deal with, with the mask issue, which is educate your owners, remind them to wear masks, provide masks in any areas where there could be, you know, multiple people gathering. Um, you know, if you're talking about a bigger association that has like, let's say a mixed use building where there's a public lobby, for example, and there's a concierge, there might be an argument that that's considered a public, a public space. I think the real issue here is that 
part of what we should be, what we should all be doing, regardless of whether a space is considered public, is taking the practical action that is known to limit the spread of this disease, which is wearing masks and washing hands. And so to the extent that associations have the authority uh, or the ability, not the authority, to keep reminding people, providing masks, and, and asking people to actually wear them. That's the practical, um, that's the practical approach to this. I don't think an association can physically force someone to wear a, ma wear a mask. There's no ability to call the cops on somebody if they're, if they're not, I mean, you can call the cops for whatever you want, right? But they're not going to come just because somebody's not wearing a mask. Um, and certainly I think it's a poor use of their time as police officers to enforce something like that. Um, so I think education, reminding people, providing masks, those are the steps that we're telling our clients to take. So, Ken, so did you have anything else to add to that? So good. Um, yeah, hold on. So are associations required to provide masks? Follow-up question to that one. I mean, no, you're not required to unless you have employees, but, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. So Ken, what, what, what were you going to say? So one of the things that a board could do is to adopt a rule that the masks have to be worn in the common areas <clears throat> or the indoor common areas because you're going to have some subset of people who are going to make the argument that they're not a public space they're not in a uh, business uh, therefore they don't have to wear a mask and so you could adopt a rule and it could be temporary until the emergency's over or permanent i guess permanent doesn't make sense but you you could adopt a rule in addition to having the signs which are uh, available to print off of the websites uh, that uh, the government has and LNI has for wear your masks. And that would at least provide a little bit more encouragement for some people. <clears throat> uh, the, you know, the question about should you supply masks, I think if you've got a concierge type situation or somewhere where you do have outside people, meaning not just residents coming in regularly, that it's an inexpensive thing for the association to provide masks and you should do it. Even though it's not been budgeted and even though you'll have some theft of masks as well, it is an inexpensive thing to show that you are taking the steps you can to help protect your membership. Um, and the question about what's a common area, your declaration already defines what common areas in it are and it's gonna include everything not a unit. So <clears throat> stairwells, hallways, lobbies, uh, parking garages, it's all gonna be something where it's outside the unit. And I think that the argument is that people should be wearing masks in all of those spaces. If you need a rule to clarify that, or you need a sign just explaining that that's what people should do, then make the sign or adopt the rule. Um, I think the big question is, is it an outdoor space where people can remain six feet apart or is it an indoor space where you have to wear the mask regardless of whether there are other people present be just because you might uh, come to another person or because the airspace may be still enough to contain the aerosol particles which contain the virus. So Gail, you had something else? You're still on mute. Here we <laughs> Sorry go. about that. Well, I was panicked because you froze while you were speaking like, oh my God, the internet's gone down. <laughs> uh, so, okay, I'm over that now. Okay, so um, I don't think we have any other mass related questions. So I think we're gonna go back to Valerie for the time being, is that right? Yep, I have one other issue to cover briefly. We had a question that came in and it's uh, from a manager that has an association that requires vendors to sign in and out with their name, time, and signature. And the board would like to consider having every visitor sign in with their name, phone number, and email address so that should a COVID-19 outbreak occur that they're made aware of, they can contact trace those who have been within their community. Um, and the question is, is this a reasonable request? There's a concierge there from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. six days a week. So it would be hard to enforce when no one is on site. Um, I think that contact tracing is a great idea. It is not something that you can require of visitors, I don't think. So um, <clears throat> you can certainly ask, but I don't think that you can require it. And we do have a lot of questions come in like this or as, you know, uh, similar questions where 
Um, we find ourselves reminding people often about the difference between requiring something, but not having the authority to require it doesn't mean that you can't ask. So I think if you're already, if you already have a sign in sheet for your vendors, um, <clears throat> or people who are delivering things, for example. It says that they are requiring vendors to sign in and out with name, time, and signature. You might consider add, adding one field to that, which is a, a way to contact the person that's signed in or, you know, that's signing in. Um, and then have a, have a sign-in uh, sheet for all visitors to the building and ask them when your concierge is there to sign in with their information. And if people ask why, you can just let them know that you're trying to do what you can to, uh, to, to you know, contribute to the contract contact tracing effort related to COVID-19. If they refuse to sign in, I don't think that you can make them. And then when your concierge is not on duty, I think you could put a big sign up with a sign in sheet um, and maybe consider having a, you know, a cup full of clean pens and a cup full of used pens so that you're kind of trying to eliminate cross contamination between people using the same you know, the same pen to sign in if they choose to do so during those off hours. But um, <clears throat> I think that, you know, we, we were, when we were discussing this question before the call, Ken was reminded of, and, and as was I, the initial requirement when re restaurants started to reopen, where restaurants were going to be required to, and patrons were going to be re required to comply with the contract, contact tracing information, um, and there was a really big backlash, a public backlash against the idea that you would have to provide your private contact information every single time you went to a restaurant or that a restaurant was going to be able to force customers to give that information. And so uh, the governor backed off on that requirement and removed it from the phase two requirements for restaurants reopening. Um, <clears throat> so we think that, you know, asking people is always an option and uh, requiring it is not probably an option especially when you're talking about visitors with whom you have no contractual relationship like you do with your owners. So I think I've covered all the stuff that I had to talk about ahead of time. So Ken, do you want to carry on from here? We had a couple other questions, some not related to uh, COVID-19. So one of them was from uh, a manager basically saying, we have a community that has an owner who has a Black Lives Matter sign in their yard. There are rules about signage and the board wants the manager to send a violation letter to the owner, even though they can't send a fine. And the question is, do we think that this is a good idea to pursue sending such a letter? So I am reminded a little bit of when the <clears throat> no Iraq war signs became really common about 15 years ago. And the, the signs, through the courts ended up being considered political speech in the same way that a, uh, a sign for Bush or Hillary was a political speech. And the US Supreme Courts decided that you cannot prohibit political speech in community associations. That doesn't mean you can't regulate it. So my question really would become one of is the problem the, the type of sign or is the board trying to regulate the message? If they're trying to regulate the message and prohibit an owner from having a Black Lives Matter or similar sign, which is expressing their opinion about an issue which is clearly political right now, then I think you cannot do that. If the sign is six by eight feet and you have a reasonable restriction on signs for other allowed purposes of two by two feet, then I think you could require the sign be two by two feet. Uh, I had a client this last week where the Black Lives Matter sign was a basically a strip of paper taped to the handrail of a condo unit and the board wanted to take it down. And for reasons that are not just legal, I think you need to be concerned that if you start taking these signs down or trying to punish owners for expressing their political speech on this, you run a significant risk that you'll have a public backlash um, similar to what we had when an association a few years ago tried to keep an owner from putting a 12th man flag up. The press was happy to uh, jump all over the management company and the uh, association and their names were actually published in a number of different 
local and national newspapers. And uh, I, I think the political backlash that which could occur or the public shaming, if you try to prohibit a political sign in our current climate is gonna be significant. So it really comes down to, you know, I would even suggest if, if the sign is just offensive, find a sign which would be acceptable to the community and either provide that to them so that they have no cost in changing to something which is compliant or at least give them the standard on what they can do so that they have the opportunity to do the political speech. Otherwise you have both a, a legal issue and you have a potentially a, a public uh, uh, embarrassment kind of issue. And when you can I, can sorry, I when you one thing, yeah. And for those of you who watch TV at the moment, you want to avoid Cynthia from Geico coming to your association and visiting. <laughs> That's very true. Uh, if anybody hasn't seen the Geico commercial about HOAs, send Gil an email and he'll give you the link. <laughs> Um, Ken, when you commented about if the sign is offensive, <clears throat> I just wanted to clarify that what you meant is if there's something about not the content, right? If it's if it's the way the sign looks, if it's the size, if it's just, you know, scribbles on a white sheet of paper that just is, it's ugly and you're will and it's not about the content, they, you can ask them to replace it or you could even replace it with a black light, like a professionally printed Black Lives Matter sign, right? You're not yes, talking about the, the, that's why I just wanted to make sure. I knew that's what you meant, but I wanted to clarify for this. If, if, if it's a piece of cardboard and you want it to be something which is uh, more appropriate to your community with the same message, then I think you can regulate it. And I, I think that doesn't offend us at the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, the challenge with the timing is that we don't have a clear beginning and ending point for dealing with this particular political issue, just as we did not for the uh, Iraq war. And so you can't, uh, you can't make a rule, which you could for a public office, that would say the sign could only be up for 60 days before the election and 10 days after the election. Because the Black Lives Matter issue is not one which has a specific date and point in time. And that's why the Iraq war issue is the most analogous, is the Iraq war continued for years. And so people who were protesting it were allowed to put their signs up for years. So what about for sale signs? Can you forbid those in associations? Uh, I think you actually can. Uh, most associations do have exceptions for, for sale signs because they do want to encourage the uh, transfer of ownership to help improve market values. Um, so other issues that have come up, uh, one which is just a little bit tangentially related is the city of Seattle has enacted a new law related to roommates, which basically prohibits a landlord from refusing to allow a roommate to move into rental housing in order to help the tenants pay their rent. And it's a pretty broad and it's very uh, progressive in terms of making sure that housing is available to more people. Uh, it is applicable technically just to landlords, but what I expect it to have happen is that if you've got a owner who's renting and that renter wants to bring in a roommate, that the inability to prohibit the roommate, which the landlord has, is going to flow uphill to the association. There's nothing in, this, in the city's ordinance which would specifically state that a condo association could not have more restrictive rules in the city, but it would be clearly contrary to the intent of the city council's uh, uh, ordinance. And I think you'd have a difficult battle trying to prohibit those roommates. Now I know that those roommates would be in violation of many of the governing documents which we work with for our communities. And so this, this is gonna come up, I just don't know when. And it doesn't mean even under the ordinance that you can't screen tenants 
It doesn't mean the tenants wouldn't still be bound by the same obligations to comply with the rules, regulations, governing documents, et cetera. But it, it does create for any uh, condo in the city limits of Seattle, an additional layer of, of you know, legal enforcement that you're gonna have to deal with. Uh, somewhat related to that, we had come up for a client this last week, a eviction for a former manager and perhaps the manager's roommate. And it's one where the former manager appears to have actually moved out and left behind their roommate. And the question is, what can the association do? The association wants to evict them immediately. It is clear that the Landlord Tenant Act doesn't apply to managers who live in housing supplied by their employer, but the breadth of the no eviction order is much beyond the Landlord Tenant Act. And it extends to non-traditional housing situations. And so we're pretty certain that the roommate who's living in this association owned unit is gonna be covered by the statute and there's gonna be no way to serve notice of an eviction or actually evict the resident for you know at least the period ending midnight on August 1st. And is there a way to collect rent from this person? I think that probably you can collect rent but you're not gonna be able to do any of the enforcement mechanisms to collect the rent. So you might be able to file a personal lawsuit against this individual down the road. Um, you know, the answer, which I think our client was not expecting us to suggest was that if they really want this person out, offer them money to leave. Because that, it sounds really contrary because they should be paying you for the privilege of living in housing you own. But if you want them out, the cheapest way is probably to offer them a thousand bucks or something to move out and get them to do it. Don't pay them until they've moved out. And we've had clients do this on occasion. And it's one of those things where clients really don't like this advice because they know they're entitled to money. They have legal entitlements. And when we say the cost of trying to enforce this and the likelihood of recovering the money owed by these individuals is really low. Uh, overall, if you're looking at what's going to be the cheapest route of getting that unit vacated, uh, you need to at least consider paying the individual to leave. Um, the last question I got, which just came in, is regarding decision making that's being done on uh, through written consent. And so the question is, <clears throat> you know, following up on a, a unanimous written consent for a board decisions, does that same unanimous written consent apply to committee decisions? And the answer is, of course, because I'm a lawyer, it depends. And what I would say is that if the, um, if the committee is exercising a power of the board, because some committees do, then I would say, yes, you need the same unanimous written consent that you would have had if the board was making that decision. If it's just an advisory committee to the board, which the board would be following up on, then it's not gonna matter how the committee it makes or advises the board about the decision because the board is who ultimately is making the decision and their decision would be recorded in the form of a uh, unanimous written consent. And I think I already talked last week about the reasons for unanimous written consent. And one is the unanim unanimity. Second is having a written record, which in Washington state can include an email from each of the members. And third is memorializing that decision by ratifying it at the next meeting and keeping copies of those written records. So with that, I am done with the topics and questions I already know about. If there's other questions or 
Val, or if you wanted to add anything, this is the time. Go ahead, Gil. I think you okay, were about so I, to say something. Okay, yeah, I do. I have a few questions that have come in through the chat, and um, I did post the HOA Cynthia YouTube <laughs> link for that Geico commercial. If you've not seen it, it's in the group chat. Okay, so let me just- You do need to remind people that National CAI <laughs> took great offense at that commercial and wrote a letter to Geico uh, asking them to apologize to the millions of homeowner associations and hardworking uh, board members who do not act like Cynthia. But we think that the National CAI should have had a little bit more of a sense of humor. Yeah, maybe somebody forgot to explain uh, what a caricaturization is to them. <laughs> we, have a, we have an attendee here who is president of CAI at the national level and president at some various uh, state uh, chapters. I'm a past president of the Washington State chapter. And I was like, whoa, this thing's really serious. And then I saw yeah. the commercial and I just burst out laughing. So yeah. anyway, we all need a little humor these days, people. Okay, so we have another uh, question has to do with meetings. So is it sufficient to post a recording of board meetings afterwards or must all owners have the opportunity to attend virtually? We actually talked about this last week, I think. Uh, and I, I'm gonna hearken back to what I said at the beginning of the Q&A today, which is we're in this for the long haul. This is no longer something that we're dealing with uh, on what seems like a short-term temporary basis meaning COVID-19 and the restrictions on our ability to gather in large groups. Um, so I think we need to stop treating the COVID-related restrictions um, like they are a temporary situation or a short-term situation and acknowledge that we're going to be dealing with at least some of these restrictions for quite a while, a year or two maybe. Um, and so in keeping with that and, and also uh, consistent with what we said last week, we do not think um, that posting a recording of a board meeting after the fact complies with an open meeting requirement if your association has an open meeting requirement. So we think it's a great way to keep people informed. If you don't have an open meeting requirement and you want to post recording of board meetings so that owners have the option of viewing those after the fact and staying informed with what's going on in their community, that's great. We, I think probably even in the beginning of all this, when we were all kind of scrambling to figure out how do we do business as how, business not as usual, right, with these new restrictions, that it was probably better than nothing for sure. But um, given that we now realize this is going to be our status quo for a while, we think that associations that are required to hold open meetings need to find a way to make the meetings truly open and to allow owners to attend in real time. Okay, so here's another meeting question. Um, so this is coming from a self-managed community. Uh, let's see, so where the board is meeting an executive committee, I'm wondering if they mean executive session, but anyway, I'll let you guys handle it. To, so again, self-managed community, boards meeting an executive committee to handle their work during COVID-19. If there are no motions passed, just updates on repairs, construction, insurance, legal advice, hopefully that legal advice is coming from us here at Condominium Law Group. <laughs> uh, should minutes be taken or a brief summary that those issues were discussed or no minutes if no motions? Hopefully that makes sense to you two attorneys here. Uh, well, I'll, I'll try and answer. So there are, different kinds of committees and some organizations and a self-managed condo association or a credit union are good examples often have an executive committee which is different than the board and the executive committee makes uh, operational decisions on a day-to-day -day or weekly basis on behalf of the organization and those are not board meetings <clears throat> they they may include some of the same people. Usually they are not the full board, they're a subset of the board and often a management team that are talking about the daily operations. So um, those are not board meetings. They are not policy making decisions that are being done and they should not be addressing issues that are appropriately board level decisions. You're not required to have meeting minutes of executive committee meetings. 
Um, there's not a statute which governs them. You might have some internal policies and procedures to allow you to keep track of those things. You might have decisions which you would make which must be approved by the board. So if the executive committee was making a decision about sending uh, some owners to collections, that might be something which has to be then actually approved by the board. If you're talking about executive sessions of the board, which are still all of the board members should not include a manager, um, it, it, like an employee manager, uh, the executive sessions should not have meetings in most or meeting minutes in most cases and decisions have to be made outside of the executive session in a regular board meeting. So the, uh, the other thing I'll comment on just briefly is that Ukiowa communities are going to have more restrictions on how to deal with the Zoom type meetings because of the requirement in Ukiowa that owners have an opportunity to comment during a board meeting. And so at a minimum, you would have to have a live session uh, where the owners would have some opportunity to comment before the meeting, at the end of the meeting, during if you wanted, but it, it's just not possible for a recorded meeting to comply with Ukiowa's open meeting requirement. I'd like to okay. jump in with a really brief comment too on the executive session question. Um, I think it's one thing if you're so if your board has basically stopped conducting regular board meetings because of COVID and is doing everything that it used to do during board meetings, but calling it executive session so they don't have to take minutes and whatnot, I, I think that's problematic. Um, I think that if you're, so I think executive sessions are generally intended to handle a relatively small subset of subjects and uh, things that are not appropriately handled in an open board meeting. So things that are, you know, attorney client privileged or um, sensitive like employment information if you have a, a, an association employee and you're dealing with an employee issue, things like that. Um, so if your board really is just sort of meeting kind of informally and chatting about association stuff, but no decisions are being made, um, that's probably fine and it's probably not required that you then have board meeting minutes. But if this is, the reason I'm feeling cautious about this is because of the wording of the question. Self-managed community where the board is meeting an executive committee to handle their work during COVID-19. This is the thing, COVID-19 isn't going anywhere. So we've been in this now for, I mean, March, April, May, June, five full months now. And it, and it could go on for another year, maybe two. If this has sort of just been what this board is doing to kind of get get through COVID and you know, we, they need to stop operating like COVID is going to end tomorrow and start figuring out how to operate properly in this environment because it's probably not going to change significantly anytime soon. So if they haven't held a single board meeting in five months and they haven't made a single board decision in five months, I, that would give me concern. So I just wanted to offer those comments. Okay, thank you both. So we do have a couple of questions in your wheelhouse, Valerie, under the collections practice area, which you head up here. So uh, in the email reminder for this meeting, there is a reference to garnishment proclamation. Can that be explained uh, as well? If garnishments are happening or if the garnishments are enforced from prior delinquency before COVID. So maybe you can just touch sure. on that for a bit. Yeah. Thank you. So just uh, for those who don't know, garnishment is um, an option that becomes available to a, an association once you have a judgment against a former or current owner. Um, and you can use that judgment to garnish bank accounts and wages to satisfy the judgment. In the very beginning, when the first proclamations were issued, uh, all garnishments were suspended and the accrual of judgment interest was also suspended. Uh, the most recent version of the garnishment proclamation um, continues to prohibit bank account garnishment, but it is now possible to garnish uh, in a person's wages to satisfy a judgment. The rationale behind that difference was that um, uh, 
people who are still receiving federal and state unemployment and other stimulus uh, money, we don't, those things are exempt from garnishment, number one, anyways. But number two, the whole point of all those stimulus payments is to be able to keep people able to pay their bills and also keep money in the economy. And garnishment interferes with that. So we are still not able to garnish bank, bank accounts. But if you have a judgment against someone, you're, you know, you can now garnish wages. The approach that CLG has taken since the prohibition on wage garnishment was lifted is that we're going back to our clients and asking them what they want to do about this because every association has a different level of stomach, I guess, for taking what some might view as aggressive or severe collection action in a time like this. And so if it's an association that would like to eventually collect the money but is not suffering financially and they don't want to, you know, they don't want to appear to be severe in their approach to, you know, delinquencies, they might choose not to go ahead with a wage garnishment. Whereas if it's an association where, you know, every penny, some of our clients, every penny really does matter. Every dollar matters. Um, and they also sometimes have homeowners that haven't been paying assessments for years. And so some of them might tell us to go ahead with the wage garnishments, but that's the recap there. Okay, we have another collections related question, Valerie. Okay. Uh, the association is sending warning letters without fines or verbiage referencing fines. When the ability to fine resumes, does a letter indicating the infraction need to be corrected or the fine will be assessed before a fine is charged or can a letter with the fine be sent based on where they are in the progressive fine structure per the rules and regulations? So okay. go ahead, Ken. Go ahead, Ken. My, my first question is going to be, have you provided an opportunity to be heard to the owner before you have assessed the fine? Because if you have not provided the opportunity to be heard, you cannot assess a fine. And so it's okay to send a violation letter without a fine. You can offer the opportunity to be heard in the violation notice, in which case it might be possible to then, when all this is done, assess a fine for repeat violations. But you need to be still following the procedures required for due process and make sure there's an opportunity to be heard. I also don't think that, and I might, I might be inappropriately or incorrectly reading between the lines here, but there's a couple of thoughts. I don't think you can sort of save up the fines that you would have assessed during the proclamation and then assess them all once the proclamation expires. I, I don't think you can do that. Um, so if somebody is uh, engaging in a repeated rule violation during the period of time that's covered by the proclamations, um, and you would be fining that person, you know, 50 bucks twice a week or something, depending on what the violation is. I don't think that at the end of the proclamation, you can go back and for a period of, you know, three, four or five months, however long we end up being affected by this proclamation, go back and retroactively fine them for the violations that occurred during that period of time. And Ken, jump in if you disagree with me on that. No, I think that's, that's true. Okay, so the other thing is, um, so, so I guess part of what that means is if you're dealing with a violation that's a, a something serious that your association really wants handled, and basically their approach to that is waiting to then find somebody retroactively at the end of the, of the proclamation period, um, my suggestion would be that you have that, your association should be working with its legal counsel to determine what enforcement options you do have now, if it's serious enough that you'd go you know, that you'd want to go in at the end of the time period and levy, you know, a thousand dollars worth of fines or whatever, you know, for that time period. Um, the other thing is, I also don't think that you can just assess a fine at the end of the proclamation period in reliance on a notice that was sent during the proclamation period, even if the notice did provide a due process opportunity. So, in other words, if there's this continuing violation, whatever it is, and you've sent all these violation notices during the proclamation period and you have been unable to find the owner, then I think what you have to do once the proclamation expires is send a new notice of the violation, refer certainly to the previous notices that were sent, and then give them actual notice of the intent to fine uh, with a due process notification, unless they've already had their due process. But um, so, all of that. Well, I have a couple comments and one is in response to the manager's chat. 
why send a violation notice if you can't send a fine? And a part of the answer is that many people do respond to violation notices because they don't know that they're doing something that's against the rules. So in the, you know, you can ask people to do something category, a violation notice is a way of asking them to comply. Uh, even if you don't have the uh, authority to do the, the fining at the same time. Also the violation notices do serve as the, uh, the history record as it were. So if you send a new violation notice after the proclamation is lifted and then again provide the opportunity to be heard before a fine is assessed, uh, you have the, the track record or history to build on. One of the things that we as lawyers want is good documentation to support actions of the board if we end up having to defend them in court or if we end up having to support the fines or collections activity in court later. And so the violation notices during the course of the proclamation do serve to provide a history that the board has tried to communicate with the board member about the, or excuse me, with the owner about the owner's obligations. And so when you do take stronger enforcement action following the end of the proclamation, it's more likely to be successful. You know, the other thing to keep in mind is that we generally give advice, which is to minimize risk to our clients that the decisions they make are going to be challenged or successfully challenged in court. There are times where you can, as a board, take action which may be enforceable in a court, we just don't know. And so some clients have more of a, a willingness to take a risk that the procedures they're following and the actions they're taking are going to be challenged or be challenged successfully in court. We tend to, to push our clients towards decisions that are going to be very likely to uh, avoid a successful challenge. We don't want you to be imposing a rule which is going to be successfully overturned by an owner who challenges it. But there are times where clients want to take actions and we'll advise them that there's a risk that this action they're taking will be challenged or that this action will not be upheld in court. And I'll say something like whether you can enforce a rule about the Black Lives Matter or whether you can enforce a rule about wearing masks. Those are examples. I don't want to end up in court trying to enforce a violation of a rule to wear a mask because I think it's, it's a waste of money. But if you have a particularly difficult owner and you're trying to, to take action because it's a violation you know you can prove because you've got security cameras showing the person not, not wearing a mask, then there might be other legitimate reasons why you would try and take a harsher enforcement action against a particular owner. And I don't know what they are because I don't know how the specifics, but it is something to keep in mind is that we are starting from the point of assuming you're trying to avoid large legal expenses when the risk of you recovering those expenses from your client are small, that your primary purpose is enforcement not to try and remove an undesirable person from the community, which is sometimes a different purpose for why you're doing enforcement. And if it's something like you're trying to get compliance with having lawns mowed because an owner has failed to do it, you still would have the ability to mow the lawn and assess that cost back to the owner if your governing documents provide for it. That is not a fine. So if your goal is to get enforcement with community standards for appearance, there may be ways other than a fine, which your documents provide for, to achieve that goal, which still are enforceable during the course of the proclamation. So, so there's a follow-up yeah, to that question, and that is, um, of Gil, course- hold on. Oh. Gil, I'm sorry to interrupt, but the other thing that I wanna remind everybody of is that the intent behind the proclamation is to protect individuals who are financially impacted by COVID-19. And, and, and whether or not we agree with the governor having lumped fines in with late fees and interest, that is what he did. 
And so <clears throat> I think the analogy that I would make is, are we going to go back at the end of the proclamation period and retroactively assess the late fees and the interest charges that we could not assess during the proclamation period? And I think that the answer to that question is no, we cannot, I do not think that that is consistent with the intent of the proclamation. I don't think that the proclamations temporarily suspend the ability um, to, uh, to collect those and then allow us to retroactively do so after the fact. Um, and I don't, know, I don't know of any of the attorneys in our practice area who are interpreting the proclamations in that manner. And so even though I know and you know that fines are different than late fees and interest, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of treating them the same way because the governor has chosen to treat them the same way. So and just I'll follow up comment. with that. Yeah, the last comment is you talked about the intent. And that is one of the challenges with these documents is that uh, the wording of your individual declarations and your individual bylaws and rules, the wording of these proclamations are not specifically what the court would look at in trying to evaluate them. They are trying to decipher what the intent of the person who drafted the document was. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you can read a different outcome into a document doesn't change how the court's going to find the intent. And so that, that is a challenge. And it's especially true when we have owners who will read into a document a different interpretation of what the, the language is because they want to read it a different way and they're saying, well, it could be read this way. And it maybe it could be read that way, but the intent of the drafter of the document is what is considered most important by the courts. So we have a follow-up question to that or comment. Um, of course, you can ask, so uh, if it is an egregious action, that is a different story. The boards are not taking too kindly to having no teeth to enforce significant violations. Um, but if it's something truly major, what just what what do you recommend? What can be done? I think it depends a little bit on what the violation is, and also it depends a lot on what the governing documents for the association allow. Last week when the proclamation expired for a day and a half again, I had a, a manager contact me because she had a board that was pushing her to send a fine notice to a homeowner who refused to move his car out of the parking garage when they were having the, I don't know, they, they, they were painting new stripes or, you know, pressure washing the surface. Some, some sort of work needed to be done in the garage. And I just said, well, no, I said, look, I know the proclamation is expired, but we think it's going to be renewed. This is exactly what happened last time. Why don't they just tow his car? Do they have the ability to tow his car? And the manager said, well, they, they didn't, they just, they thought they didn't want to tow the car. They thought a fine would be more effective. And, and well, number one, I don't think a fine would be more effective. I think the guy's the car being towed actually accomplishes the end result, which is your ability to do the work in the garage where the owner is refusing to move his vehicle. Um, but it makes the point that there are alternatives depending on the type of violation. So if it's a landscaping fa failure to maintain your property in an HOA and your association has self-help provisions in the, in the governing documents, then send a notice. There's usually a reasonable notice required. So you have to give the owner an opportunity to do the maintenance that they have fa failed to do. Send a notice and say, if you don't do X, Y, Z within two weeks, we're going to do it and assess the cost to your property or to your account if that's provided for in your governing documents. So essentially, you have to be looking for creative, non-fine alternatives to, um, to fines to enforce these rules. Yeah, the other thing is that certain kinds of violations, you know, they do affect the building. We've had two clients in the last month where owners have been doing interior work and damaging common elements. And so we, in both of those, the city was willing to let their code compliance people come out and help to enforce the uh, safe work on the building. So you're not precluded from going to those other outside entities if they are willing to participate. And two different cities, Kirkland and Seattle, were willing to uh, enforce code compliance for the association. So I know we're about out of time, but we have two quick questions and then we're done. Um, if the declaration provides for self, 
self-help to solve an issue, can a warning letter be issued? And since we need to skip the fine process of compliance, can we move straight to self-help and charge yes. the offending homeowner the cost to bring into compliance? That would, that's what I just covered, essentially. Okay. So yes, provided Perfect. your documents allow it and you follow the procedures outlined, yes. Perfect. Uh, the last question for today's Zoom conference is, when taking a loan from reserves, does the amount of time the loan will be needed factor into whether or not all of the components of the RCW, unanimous board consent, repayment plan, et cetera? So the statute doesn't have a time component for how long you've borrowed the money. I would say that if you borrowed the money and repaid it within the same calendar month, there would be no obligation to provide the notice to all the owners. Uh, if you were going to redo it within the next calendar month, I'd probably suggest that it's also not necessary. But if you don't know when you're going to be repaying, I would suggest that you should comply with the requirement to give notice to all of the owners that you have made that withdrawal from reserves to pay for some other expense. And to, we need really specifics for your community to give any better advice. Super. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, we still have a lot of interest in these, which is great. So we'll see you next Wednesday at 10 a.m. Don't thanks, be a thief in your HOA. <laughs> Bye everyone. Have fun. Have a good week.